Hi, my name is Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Naima Ramos Chapman, a screenwriter, director, and actress. Naima has written, directed, and acted in episodes of Random Acts of Flyness, written on episodes of Betty, and is slated to direct the upcoming Showtime series, How to Make Love to a Black Woman. We talk with Naima about subtext in filmmaking, what it was like working on Random Acts of Flyness, creating socially conscious work, and much more. And now, on to our interview. Hi, Naima. Welcome to the Black Film Space podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, I'm in, Flat- well, I'm not in Flatbush. My mom is in Flatbush, and I'm in bed and I'm looking outside my window, and everything's good, considering there's a pandemic outside. Well, your work is primarily rooted in magical realism and surrealism. So at what point as a creative did you realize you wanted to create these types of films? And also what made you want to go in this direction creatively? I basically fell into filmmaking, not quite by accident. I think it was sort of um, a roundabout journey. I used to uh, study dance for several years. Um, Well, since I was three years old um, and then more semi-professionally, I was training pretty intensely at Alvin Ailey School for Dance during... um, my tenure at professional performing arts school. So it was four years of very intense dance training. And for a while I thought I was going to go um, and become like a concert professional dancer, or maybe, you know, be in the Ailey company um, or at some modern dance company. But towards the end of my senior year, uh, I got pressured a lot to sort of make a decision in terms of like, if you're going to be a dancer, you can only do it. And it's kind of this way, not necessarily that's what they said, but that's what I felt was sort of, um, uh, institutional style of Ailey. And I'm very thankful for it being my first artistic home. I think it taught me so much about filmmaking. Um, and it's very, I use a lot of gestural choreography and I think about how the camera moves in space because of it. Um, but I, I've always been sort of, um interested in various types of storytelling or like what is the best way I can reach as many people as possible and kind of express my vision and truth whether it's through dance or acting which I started doing later in life um or journalism when I was um, studying journalism in college and then uh also worked at several webzines and at a, a think tank and did a lot of advocacy work in that space, uh, but it was always about storytelling and how to how to get at the root of um, not only being able to very concretely express what it is, what is happening in reality, but also um, juxtaposing that with what is imagined, how we see ourselves, um, you know, h- how the residue of the past can kind of collapse onto the present. And so, with magical realism, I think that that element sort of came out of my um, attraction to books by Gabriel Marquez and just, you know, um, his ability to talk about or write about rather memory and how different characters in his novels would just remember a day differently. And it was unapologetic in kind of blending memory with reality. And so my references often are not even, or Toni Morrison, I think it's also a really good example of her her novels feeling very rooted in like real feelings, real people, but the imagery always feels like there's another dimension happening, um, but it's not like fantasy. Um, and so I think Gabriel Marquez and Toni Morrison were super influential. It's like all I read when I was a kid. Um, and Don Quixote and like um, Les Miserables and just really just a, a voracious reader. And then other, I just sort of learned things along the way and came into filmmaking through documentary with journalism. And then finally, um, when I was trying to merge the two, I met uh, 
Terrence Nance and he just sort of suggested that maybe filmmaking is a way to encompass all of these things that I was interested in. Um, and I think my style is just really how I see the world. Uh, it's not, I don't really look at other filmmakers, although I think I'm influenced by them and the more I like study, it becomes apparent. Um, but I do try to really, when I'm writing um, or envisioning something, it's what is coming out of my imagination based on texts that I'm reading or, you know, people within my community that I want to have a conversation with that's difficult and how I kind of want to, sh to open the door between what has happened in the past and acknowledge trauma, but then also, you know, imagine um, a world that looks a little different and is shifted if we just sort of accept all of these different aspects of ourselves. Um, so that's sort of where my style comes from. I think it comes from a lot of reading um, different novels and, you know, some of my favorite filmmakers are, you know, Julie Dash, of course, and Kathleen Collins. I love the film Killer of Sheep. Those are some of my references. So yeah, I, I kind of just think about my dreams and my people. So in Culture Magazine, you were quoted as saying, spoken language can be limiting, but I think sitting, listening, being with someone, there's so much there. The films that typically move me are often about what's not said. You did mention some films that you know inspired you, but I'd love for you to expound on it if you can. I think my experience in, in journalism was really amazing because it got me courageous and kind of figure out how to like move through a, a bunch of guys to get to the front to like interview a governor or like, you know, someone who might not quote unquote seem like an expert about like immigration reform um, and get their perspective. So there's that element of storytelling, but visually speaking, well, even doing those interviews, I remember um, having to pay like really close attention to like subtext and what people weren't saying spoke a lot of volumes, but I would be kind of distressed by my, you know, with journalism, you can't write about people's feelings unless they tell you about them. And so you can write, you can write down like the way maybe their eyebrow twitches or, um, if they put their hand on their neck to protect it, um, or if they're sweating, or you know, if they're walking back and forth, you can write those things. And I think I learned to be a very astute observer. And um, I like to think that that definitely comes out in my work. And I mean, I just love films like Lucretia Martel. She just is able to create such a tone and um, a visual language based on how people's relationships um, to space work out. And so I'm thinking of like La Cienega, for instance, there's so much in terms of, you know, the way the family drags, there's a scene where they're like dragging these chairs and it's scraping against the floor and they're like drinking cups of wine. And there's a certain level of like, we're relaxed by the pool, but there's a, there's something hanging in the air in the atmosphere and, um, thinking about, you know, Killer of Sheep is, is, there's so much kinetic energy in that film and uh, being able to tell a lot of story just by like where you're positioning the camera and you're like peeking into a small room where there's, you know, the little girl in that film when she's like speak, singing to her doll. Like there's all these like um, mm -hmm. moments that just speak so, so profoundly that, that resonate with me as opposed to like, the way we wish maybe people communicate in the world, which is like, I'm feeling sad and this isn't right. You shouldn't touch me. Like, right. You know, and no, no shade to films that are didactic. I think there is like, there's beauty in, in, you know, Spike Lee does it better than anybody like talking direct to camera, but there's an acknowledgement there too. And it's a stylistic choice. And in some ways it is sort of like, affirming and wishing there were there were moments more like that in our interactions. I'm kind of also obsessed with this idea that language being a dominant exchange, like words are so limiting. And I, I think as a society, if we paid more attention to how people feel and we're just more perceptive um, in terms of the body language, we could maybe, you know, provide space and even moments of peace where people are saying, they, they can't say what they actually need. And not to like overanalyze people, but I think learning that language, like body language or, you know, um, just like being witness 
to sound and like other ways that genius appears, I think only expands our, our way of thinking about how we know the world. Cause you know, not everybody talks so simply, you know, I'm just even no. thinking about my mom, like my mom, I love her and she's such a powerful woman, but she says so much with her hands, you mm. know, um, or like the way she is breathing or the way she, you know, plays with my hair or doesn't, you know, like there's all of these other, other languages and, you know, across cultures, like, you know, there's a head nod or even if I'm thinking about my godmother, she would like twitch her nose. And I, I, I thought that was like a way to say, I love you. Um, and there's, and I think there's some things like even in the way that we dress, um, that I also pay attention to, like, what does that say about how you feel about yourself? And all of this is like ways you can play in film and really like um, speak to your audience in not only in the way you're writing, but like what you're writing in those scenes. Like what does, um, what does it look like when a woman is hoarding a hundred plants in her room? Like, what does that say about her personality? You know, especially if they're right. like, you know, all living and she has three jobs. I tend to ramble. <laughs> this is really, really great. Are there particular elements, not, you know, nonverbal elements that you enjoy the most using? I'm kind of a little obsessed with envisioning like non-complimentary behavior and kind of um, examining survivorhood or um, ways that women create like a dozen strategies aside from like talking in order to get anywhere if that makes sense like mm -hmm. um I think so much of my experience as a woman is being able to uh yes sometimes take up space but then also really read the room or like um I might have to figure out where the exits are and like or really listening um or being hyper vigilant when I had to walk in my neighborhood and you know sometimes it was in a way that felt like I was being encroached on in terms of my like safety, but other times it's just to acknowledge like a neighbor um, or to connect, especially now, you know, during a pandemic. Right. Um, you know, like there's so much expressivity in people's eyes and like, and we have to think of new ways to like be moved and move people without touching them. Um, and so for me, I, I'm always interested in like writing in scenes where the focus is about like, touch and compassion in a way that feels sometimes more authentic than the things that people are saying. In Random Acts of Flyness, I came up with like the idea for Black ASMR or like these little vignettes of um, detailed moments in like my neighborhood where, you know, a woman's, a woman is kind of like just lotioning her hands with shea butter and like her nails are like, I like, I love women's like acrylic nails and the designs that they put on them and like, I think it says so much about someone's personality in terms of how they keep their hands. And Definitely. that and like just seeing the way someone ties their do-rag or like, I remember watching my friend being like, oh, I gotta go outside and fight. And like the procedure she would, the ritual she would do in order to get ready for that, I used to think was <laughs> absurd, but it was also like real. It was like, okay, I got Vaseline. I gotta get the rat tail comb. I have to put this do-rag on. I gotta put these Tims on. And so it was, it's just like a way to acknowledge those, those details that for me are the most gratifying when I can get them into a script and people are, are like, not um pushing me to get take them out because they don't understand but i'm like no, no no this is specific and it means a lot we need that moment i do love it when i can get figure out a way to um kind of disrupt our expectations about like so, like someone who's femme what they're allowed to do in space um whether mm -hmm. it's like you know dancing randomly in the street and um or jumping on a car or you know if there's a a police chase scene that maybe they don't run away and somehow confront the police officer in a very surprising like oh you're not supposed to do that because you know I feel like we're inundated with these images of real tragedy I remember having a gun pointed at my face by a police officer I remember being handcuffed you know but also witnessing my friend like wrestle out of handcuffs and be like fuck you and and live like live after that and it's sort of how come hmm. we don't see those images more um, and why does that feel inauthentic? You know, it's, it's sort of like, can we imagine freedom or escape or, or ways that like my mom or I have confronted 
like and and have survived and in a and because I think those are important too to see that we don't always um, die, you know, and in some ways we're just we're very strategic and we understand how to move around um, these institutions, uh, racist people, all of the the different ways that um, white supremacy tells us we can't move around and move freely. Um, so I'm, I'm always interested in like, okay, let me accept what, what, is, what is true, but also that there are other worlds in which we are centered. At our organization, you know, we have conversations obviously about like writing scripts, we have screenwriting workshops. And before one of our workshops, we were having a discussion about giving feedback to screenplays that don't follow the traditional three act structure that is always recommended. So, you know, if you go to film schools or read books about screenplays, they tell you to follow that structure. But there's a lot of Hollywood films that don't follow that. I wanted to know how you feel about that as someone that focuses on experimental work. How do you assess how you want to structure your story? And also, how do you still keep it effective? Because, you know, most audiences are trained to look at a film unconsciously via the lens of a three-act structure? Well, I didn't go to film school and I'm, I'm not proud of it or and I'm not not proud of it. I think I feel very thankful though that I didn't go to, I think I have like, not a problem with authority, but if an institution tells me <laughs> I have to do something a certain way, it, it definitely rubs me the wrong way. But I have a lot of friends who went to NYU and Tisch and you know, mm -hmm. I, can, I can also tell the way that they're, the way they learned uh, how to structure a story becomes like, comes in handy and I definitely like am in the process now of, of reading up on structure and I you know Aristotle poetics and but I also just feel like you know we don't give ourselves enough credit where we have we are also inundated with three-act structure so even right. if you try to break out of it I think trusting that it's gonna make sense is more than half the battle and like I think not overthinking it and being being free to kind of make that first draft whatever you want it to be and however you see it and with all its idiosyncrasies and imperfections is going to be your voice and then don't do don't do the job of trying to structure it like in your first draft it just sort of limits you and um you know i have i have friends who do beat outlines and i feel like august wilson you know i can't quote him verbatim but and i'm paraphrasing Sure. He, he basically says that like, that the characters speak to him and they kind of tell him what's right. So I think that's also a valid way, you know, things channel and come through you. And I don't think you should um, distance yourself from that. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's all these other ways to tell stories. Like, you know, I read the Palm Wine Drunkard and I love, I love sort of, there's, a lyrical way or like you know music structure you can make a film that kind of feels like a song and mm. i think people are also trained in that and also you know life is not like a film but we seem right. to enjoy it you know and so like moments like just watching your mom cook or a certain quote-unquote scene play out where it doesn't have a resolve um also can feel very satisfying you know and also can be very healing and more realistic than than tying a very neat bow in the third act. And so, you know, and I'm always kind of thinking about, I don't know if I want to make films, you know, after five years or. Really? I, well, I mean, I love it. Yeah. Or I definitely want to make films, but I think, <laughs> I think in some ways the like the comp, the, the writing about conflict and trauma and like what really hurts and having people sit in pain without a way out to me is frustrating when I watch film um especially like hollywood films where i'm like you know i'm not i'm not anti-brutality but i'm always like but to what end like right. how are i want to i want to be able yes to see certain ways that maybe life has gotten me down but i also want to see a way out and if you can't offer that to me and it's very nihilistic and it's ending it kind of just feels like the fuck is this and so um sometimes i get frustrated because i think what i love about experimental filmmaking is that it allows itself to to be more of like open to to beauty and healing and being an escape being like a solve you know i love catwalk by khalil joseph and so 
you know, then that doesn't have a ending. And so, you know, I love sort of meeting people where they're at, where they're expecting the conflict, but how can we use surrealism or magical realism to figure out a way out that also feels realistic, that feels like life, that feels like, you know, the way that my mom and dad managed to, you know, figure out ways to circumvent like foster care and mass incarceration and police brutality and all of these things. And they're like in their seventies, you know, whole and happy. And so, um, and black, you know, and Puerto Rican and, you know, with a pension, you know, under like living in a house. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in also breaking down these romantic ideals of how life is supposed to go. Cause like, for instance, in a pandemic, I realized I'm like, oh my God, I have a romanticized idea of like, someone saving me <laughs> or, you know, being somewhere at the right time with the right people where this would be easier. And instead I'm having to sit with myself um, and go through like past memories and like sit with feelings and work those things out and then just be okay with not being in control of the ending. Cause I don't know how it's going to end. Um, and I think, I love films, but sometimes if it, if it makes me leave like, ah, that's really nice life. I just feel a little like it's dishonest, um, but yeah. <laughs> but sometimes people have happy endings, no? That's true, you're totally right. Happy endings, but you know what it is? I'm not anti-happy ending. I just like a little opening. Like I, I, love, I, like, I like to have the audience co-create with me. It's like, I don't want to give you the whole thing. I want you to lean in and be like, oh man, like, what is that ending for me? Because so much of a film, it's, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's about being entertained um, or at least some things are, but I don't, I don't want to simply entertain people. I want to move them into like, oh, I didn't think about this. Oh, like that made me feel, that made me feel seen and witnessed but what comes next is somewhat up to us you know it's not i'm not getting a message or i'm being preached at about how things need to be so there's like a message there's like a forward momentum but i'm kind of like can you do some of the work with me um as opposed to you you know yeah no like i've definitely had a colleague say to me you know as black characters, we need to be redeemed in film. You know, we need to feel good. And I was like, well, that's not always, you know, necessary. Sometimes to tell particular stories, you have to show what's real. You know, I think it's up to the filmmaker and what they want to communicate to the audience, you know? So I hear you too. I, I hear your point of view for sure. Can you tell us a little bit about, I'm just pivoting here a bit, um, your journey from acting school and then how that helped with you directing, especially for TV. I really suggest that if you want to be a director, you should definitely go take some acting courses. Um, just because like, I really try not to, to instruct people to do, I feel more comfortable as a director if I can um, ask you to do something or direct, give you a direction that I also would understand you know, and I'm not just like in my head. And um, if I'm asking you to go somewhere that I've at least tried to go there so I can kind of respect the process of what it takes, to like, um, you know, re-trigger certain memories or fall a thousand times, you know, if you are in a scene where you get shot and like what, what you have to go through mentally in order to make that feel real on screen. Um, so I went to, um, the Barrow School for Acting. It's really great. Seth Barish and Lee Brock, um, they, they run the school and they're masters at their craft. And what I really loved about going to that institution was sort of how accessible it was. It was sort of like, here's some tools that you can come and make, make of it as you wish, but it wasn't a very pretentious place. It wasn't very like, you know, um, I've heard some horror stories of like, you know, a bit abusive in terms of pushing actors to certain places. And um, now maybe not abusive, but like, you know, you just are Inappropriate, really- Inappropriate, probably. Yeah, just like, I don't know if we gotta do all that. Like, I like, I, I like to give people per permission to go as hard as they want to figure out the job. But like, um, 
I'm not trying to manipulate or trick anyone into like being traumatized for a film. <laughs> um, unless that's something that they are interested in. And we've had a conversation before we've made the film um, and that's their process. Cause that, that's another thing, every actor has their own process. And I think you don't really know that unless you've um, tried out a few different workshops or courses. Um, so, I mean, it really helps me not like understand what it takes to be that vulnerable on screen and um, respect actors and their craft. And um, I just love it. I mean, I love acting and I love directing and I just love having those conversations between like another artist who is bringing so much to the table and kind of just like leaving it open for us to have a conversation as opposed to, you know, I, I do have a vision, but I'm not scared of, of um, that person like having done like a lot of deep homework on their character and their motivations and kind of just letting them show me what what they're thinking and like oh okay that might be actually a little bit better like i'm not so locked in to you saying that line that way right so now we have like we have eight possibilities instead of just one um you know and i think i've also learned one tip is like you know don't over note it in the beginning i think a lot of um directors you know you get nervous and you feel like you have to know all the answers and you want to like give eight notes but that can be so overwhelming um, to anyone and so maybe just like your job is to keep the morale and keep things going but also make make time slow down so that people have enough <laughs> for themselves to get there so um it's a nice delicate balance of like how to move really like knowing what you want but giving making making it feel easy how do you deal with the actor that might not be nailing it how do you steer them in the right direction mm. <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to think i don't know if that's ever actually happened um that's to, a testament to your skill oh thank you thank you i haven't Seriously. yeah I haven't, I haven't had someone like utterly like bomb <laughs> um, <laughs> i'm knocking on wood i do believe if, if an actor is struggling it's it is the director's like they just it's just something in that communication or or being afraid or maybe time ran out um not to put mm. blame on the director but i like to uh, i don't think it's really the actor's responsibility there's like so many ways to get a shot um and get the right charge or magic on screen um but i don't think i've actually had a moment where i was like oh wow we have to like we're not gonna get it oh but sometimes i have to rewrite i'll say that on the spot on the fly and i'm i'm a huge fan like one thing that I struggle with is, uh, or I don't struggle with, but like what I love to do because I, I, I write, direct and act and all that is like, really at the end of the day, it's about how it's all happening in reality. Mm -hmm. And we all like, we all need to let go of our ego. So if you wrote that and it sounded really cool in the reading or it looks great on the page and it's not working for the actor, like do not force them to do it. Like find another way to get, get the sentiment. But often I see, you know, writers get locked into like hearing those words a certain way. And I like absolutely hate it. Um, but that's also just me. I think there's some films that it's kind of a style, stylistic choice as well. And it kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, I've definitely had to rewrite things where I'm like, that scene is just not working or it feels too forced. And, you know, there are scenes that I've, I've directed where I, I'm like, ah, oh, that, that works, that's good enough, but I could tell that maybe I was layering too much or this moment was very dense and um, that actor may not, that they understood my intention because it was sort of like stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's okay. You know, sometimes I think you just have to be really, also might work, like being nervous or confused in the scene is, is valid too. Um, so yeah, I think you just have to roll with it, but. Yeah, so I've had to change things in a moment and be like, oh yeah, this scene's not working. We gotta rewrite the line. Right. Um, Random Acts of Flyness was one of the most experimental TV shows in modern history. What was it like in the writer's room and what was it like directing episodes of that show? 
I'm so glad it was the first writer's room I've ever been in because I think it really set the tone in a beautiful way about what is possible. Um, you know, there's some amazing filmmakers I had the privilege of being being near and learning from, like Nuatama Badomo, Mariama Diallo, um, Chaka King, Darius Monroe, uh, of course, Terrence Nance, um, Jamin Washington, Nelson Nance, trying not to forget anybody. But yeah, it was it was such a transformative moment because I, I definitely believe that when we were all making the show, um, Terrence made it very, very clear that our voices were wanted and it wasn't about trying to create like a Terrence Nance show. It was like, what is your perspective in terms of what you want to see, um, the conversation you want to have? And so I think everyone felt very affirmed and free to just like, like pitch their boldest um, idea for the show and kind of just feeling like this was like the moment to do it. Like if we were, if we want to shift consciousness, what does that look like? If we want to center, center blackness and think about it in a way that is um, across dimensions and uh, inclusive of genders and non-binary and fluid, like what does that look like? And um, so the room was just very like, it was, it was fucking great because it, it was amazing. And um, we had so many great ideas and not all of them made it in, but I mean, a lot made it in. <laughs> what was the other part of your question? What was it like directing the show? Um, yeah, I mean, so the writer's room was just like top notch, amazing. And all black, which I think is super important. Like it is, that's amazing. It is hands down way more important to have the right voices in the room than it is to have like what people, what the system will call like experience. Um, and I really, really am proud that like that happened in, in, in that room. And I, I think it also gave permission for other rooms to be, to try to like make that happen on their shows. Um, but for directing, I mean, it was, it was wild. It was, it definitely pushed me um, beyond anything I had done before, but I felt very like prepared. And um, I directed quite a few segments. Um, Terrence was always sort of like present and, and helpful and like, you know, his, his touch and it is, it is his show in a sense, like is definitely, you know, throughout the entire season. Um, he was very supportive and I think he really wanted to make sure that um, we, the writers were in the room because everybody there was, were also directors that they had an opportunity to um, push from like the page into production, um, their vision. And, you know, he'd be around because he just loves, that's, he, you know, he's just great. He's a great collaborator in that way. And um, so, it was, I mean, it was amazing. We cried. I remember Whoopi Goldberg, she was like, cracking mad jokes. Um, she was super like funny and 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 would and just very generous. Um, I remember it just felt very healing. There were a lot of a lot of things I put in there about, you know, um, conversations I wanted to have with my Dominican cousins about like anti-blackness or about homophobia and there were conversations about maternal mortality I wanted to have with a very close friend of mine who um, was having trouble in her pregnancy and um, feeling heard and seen by um, hospitals that, you know, if, if a black woman says that she's in pain or like something's wrong that they were, you know, she'd feel dismissed and, um, and sort of just really capturing like in that moment, what it was like, um, at least in that time for the people I, I held dearest to my heart. And so I felt like the directing was a way to, you know, acknowledge and then re-envision something, so another place to go. And, and there was a lot of moments of joy in that too. And, you know, um, making a musical, I would have never, I would have, I would have never written a musical um, on my own per se, but I think being, being told like, hey, you could totally write a musical, like go do it. Um, it was like so much fun. Um, and then, Acting in it too was a lot of fun. It was just great. I mean, I have, there's no there's no complaints. It was, a, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was long hours. It was a lot of hard work. 
there were many times we all cried. There were many times, you know, we were super tired, but we always felt that there was um, something amazing happening. And I, and I think it happened. It's dope. It's so dope. Can you talk um, about prepping to direct episodes? What was that process like? I prepped for that show and then for a pilot, and they are very they were very different experiences. And I don't know how conventional, I think every, there's so many different ways to make a television show or to make a film, but. Um, Maybe compare uh, Random Acts of Flyness since it's a pretty unique experience to the more traditional model. Yeah, I mean, I felt like there was a lot, there was less boundaries around um, artists, like, the, there's a certain tone set that like your voice as an artist mattered. So, you know, I would pop into a costume and, um, or have a conversation with Akeem McKenzie, um, who did the production design, um, Sarah Williams, she did um, costume and um, Risha Rocks did makeup. And like, we would have multiple conversations about, you know, I might give an image and be like, oh, I love No Sesso. I love these clothes. Like, this is sort of the vibe I want to see. And then, you know, we would just kind of talk back and forth, but um, it felt very, like also very free. And, and you know, Akeen would just sort of show me certain images or like we would go to my house and I would take photos of it. And so prep felt very intimate as well. It was just like really based on um, however you saw it and just kind of exchanging um, those images and um, I mean, people worked really, really hard. I have as many conversations up until production as possible. And I do try to show images or storyboards or a shot list beforehand, but I also, you know, want to respect artists. And the reason why I want to work with people is not just so they can execute like a machine. It's because who they are at their core makes sense for the work. And it's, it's for them as well. It's for them to be seen too. I, sometimes I'm like, well, what is, what, how does your mom dress? You know, it doesn't have to always look like my mom, <laughs> you know, um, and just sort of blending in our realities so that we're co-authoring. Um, cause it, cause it's always like, yeah, I can make a film in my, my room by myself, but that's not fun. So yeah, it was, it was just a lot of conversations, a lot of image sharing, image banking, kind of just making it very big and then kind of seeing what to take away so that there's a cohesive um, idea. Sean Peters was really amazing. I think he, he handled the lighting. Terrence also, he did, he helped a lot in terms of making sure the lighting and, and all that made sense too in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a really great team. Lo lo location scouting <laughs> is important. Um, and yeah, it was just a lot of work constantly being in conversation. And I think it helped to be a writer on it. So you didn't right. have to like, often you might jump in after that process and you have to like worry about people's feelings and like pitch a different scene. But like, if you've already written the thing, you kind of know. And um, sometimes people will find a better location. You just have to be flexible and adapt. So um, it was great. Um, can you also talk about uh, prep in relation to the script? Like, did you break it down in a particular way? You know, was the schedule composed based on different parts of the script? That's a brilliant, brilliant question. I actually kind of know, don't know. <laughs> like, I, I think the producers, they were handling so many things. Sometimes we just wouldn't really know the locations and what was gonna happen until like a few days before and we would just go with it. Or there would be like a black box situation or like we're in this studio and then you arrive on the day and you're like, okay, this is what I have to work with. Um, so it was very, I think this was very ambitious. Um, it was sort of, you knew what the ideal was but there was so many moving parts. I often had to like, Oh, I'm like, oh, this is the first time I'm seeing the room. <laughs> um, and then kind of wow. figure out the shots. Yeah. And for some people, some shows, I don't think it's like that. But I don't know. Every show is different. I kind of enjoyed that flexibility and kind of always pushing to find the best thing for the art, as opposed to like, oh, this will do. But then you kind of like see it on screen. You're like, this will not do. So that's sort of, does that answer your question? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the, it wasn't a traditional shooting schedule. Yeah, I mean, I think there was. I just wasn't really, like, we had a great um, production manager. Um, we had great producers. But there were also times where, like, we would maybe find the shots, <laughs> figure it out on a day. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't happening. <laughs> Based on your experiences, when do you think a filmmaker should feel ready to direct episodes of television? Oh, I mean, whenever you want to. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> I feel like you never feel ready. Um, I before Random Max, I I had only made one short film. I no, that's not true. I made I made several films. I made a, a several doc, documentary short artist profiles. I sometimes forget how much I've made. Um, and, you know, those are really great. And they're on Brick. You can find them. But they're, um, they're called Brooklyn is Masquerading as a World. And then I made it Nothing Happened, um, which was my first short film that was at Slam Dance, I believe, in 2016. And then um, I had nice. made yeah, I had maybe just finished Pew Pew, which was my second short. And then I was working, or maybe I didn't even finish Pew Pew. I don't remember. But then I worked on Random Max. And um, I never didn't, I didn't feel not ready because I felt very supported by everybody there. And so I think, you know, as a filmmaker, it's really just about like being confident in your voice. Um, but also maybe when you're first starting out, like make sure you have made things with people who believe in you, as opposed to having to prove your worth or your vision to people who don't believe in you or just feel like you can't do it. Because I've been in situations like that where um, I'm like, okay, you, you have some doubts, <laughs> but that was not how I felt on Random Acts of Blindness. And that, that really is a credit to like, Terrence and um, all the other filmmakers and the producers, because they were just very like, yeah, you can totally make this. Like, you know, you don't you don't have to have made a feature film in order to direct television, because the voice is what matters. And all these all of these other really amazing specialized um, folks who've done it longer, they do know how to do it. So I think as a as a as long as you have a strong vision and you can communicate clearly and you are in the game all the time. And I mean like, you know, this don't just moving past fear or like, if you want something, you gotta say it and you gotta say it more than one time for it right. to show up on set. And like, you know, people will persuade you to make other decisions. And I think you wanna listen, but I think if, if it's about the vision, try to figure out a way to make that happen and people will be thankful at the end, even if it's hard for them to get those things. Um, yeah, while you're working with them. So I think you're ready whenever you're ready. It just depends on whether or not like Hollywood thinks you're ready. And I think that's, that's a different conversation. And so if it's more of like, what do I need for, you know, a studio exec to take me seriously? I think you- Let's go there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you just, you really do have to make, make work all the time with your friends until, until you're undeniable and or you realize you don't care to, to make it. And I think you care about the craft and it'll, it'll figure itself out. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm wary of being validated by the system. Like, I feel very fortunate in terms of my career and the trajectory of it, but I, I am always trying to encourage directors and writers that they, that, you know, just think of it as you are, you are being hired to get fired. You know, um, nobody wants milk toast. You know what I mean? They, they don't know what they want, but they, they don't want crap. And so, but there's, they will sometimes ask you for crap. They will ask you for something that they feel is comfortable. It feels familiar. It feels like, but they don't know how to make the thing you know how to make. So I think it's just, it's just being very, um, if it feels like in your gut, this has to be like this, even though I've never seen it before, <laughs> then go with that um, and trust yourself and just, you know, be confident. 
<laughs> how did you negotiate with executives that have like a fixed way of viewing things versus, you know, you're more experimental, they would say risky <laughs> perspective. Y'all think I'm experimental? I feel like- Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> no, I just think that I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I, this, is, this is how everybody is like, no? Your point of view is definitely unique. You know what I mean? And it's something that doesn't always fall within the realm of what a studio has in mind. So did you have to like advocate for a particular, you know, decision creatively that you wanted to make? And if so, how did you do that? You just have to, this sounds so corny, but I do really believe you have to speak from your heart and study and do your research. You have to know who you're talking to. So much of it is also like, who, who like, it's not about being chosen all the time. It's like you are also driving your career. And so you get to also pick who you work with. And so trying to force a relationship where it's like, you don't make films like they make, like they have a certain thing. Um, and there's, there's plenty of studios um, emerging and existing or producers or people who can also um, be a buffer between like your creative voice and like what what are the things you kind of need to say in the room in order to make people feel um comfortable with your vision or that like it can be executed and that's going to be great um but i don't know i just i personally just speak from my heart i get really detailed i kind of just you know pitch what it is that i want to make that i'm interested in and um I try to know the world as much as I can up and like up till the day I pitch. But ultimately there's so many things out of my control that I, I don't, I don't sweat it if I don't get the gig or the job. Um, and I've learned that, you know, if you're confident in your voice and people will always remember how you made them feel um, when you walk out of a room. And I think they want to feel you and who you are. And it's not about the film so much. It's like, do I want to work with this person? And if the answer is yes, the, the outcome of the film almost, it, it does matter, but it kind of doesn't matter. Um, and I right. think you also want to work with those people in the room too. Um, and I think it's also understanding that collectively you are after the same thing. It's just people have different motivating factors. Like they want it to make a bajillion dollars. And, but also I think they are, you know, execs are also there because, you know, we all are after a certain feeling and a certain um, energy and this sort of, I want to feel everything. I want to feel down low and then laugh and cry. And then I want a way out where I can imagine a better day. And so everyone wants that. It's just like how we're getting there and reminding them along the way. And that does start with your initial pitch, but then it's like, you have to carry that momentum to the end, like, like in, into the shop. And so it's like, how do you have that um, stamina? I think it's, it's a lot of it is about stamina, but I don't, yeah, I don't have like any tricks or anything like that. I just, no, no. <laughs> just you know, I, wish I did, I just, you know, I just, I just do as much work as I feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. um and always feel like like filmmaking it takes a long time so don't do shit that you do not feel like you want to invest your time and energy and like you you love to do it because because it's not gonna work out um if you kind of feel like uh eh, this will this will make me famous like it, it or this will make this will get my like name in the game or this will look good on my resume because it won't you know because people can feel that they can feel it when you're forcing your career forcing your point of view for sure they can um yeah. can you talk about your experience with the sundance institute um you know we've heard that they shred your screenplay <laughs> um what are your thoughts on that <laughs> and oh what was your experience like where did you hear that from <laughs> through the grapevine i guess you could say <laughs> oh, shit. The industry grapevine. <laughs> that they shredded it? That's so fascinating. You disagree? Um, 
that's so funny. I'm like, ooh, I want to know what the words, what people are saying, shredded it. Um, I think perhaps they may not have known. No, I don't know. I felt very supported at the Institute. It was a very short workshop. I don't really know how um, in depth I'm trying to think if that's like a cool, it's a cool like legend, like they shredded her script. <laughs> it was too experimental. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe it depends on the writer, the project, who's, you know, leading the institute, who knows. But maybe I should ask, what was your experience like? And how do you think it helped with your uh, writing skills? Right, right, right. Well, you know, um, <laughs> It was the first, it was the first draft. And I, I feel like. It was the first people. draft of your screenplay? Yes, you it was my first That's draft. Amazing. What? Wow. Okay. So, okay. so they could shred it if they want to. I think it was fine. Um, <laughs> it, was like, it was like a first draft. And most of the questions that came my way were just sort of about, is this a shooting script or is this a script to sell? Because I think you know, um, institutions are about structure. It's really, I felt like Joan Tewksbury was there for the, the workshop. And I learned so much from like the very quick, sev like several minute prompts that she would have for us in terms of like, okay, now write for 15 minutes and now share it and I write. And, and um, I thought I learned so much in a very short amount of time and met some amazing people who've made amazing films. And I also felt that um, there weren't a lot of people who look like me in the room. You know, I think people's cultural references also matter in terms of when they're looking at work. And if you pair people who've, who've made films that are nothing like yours and they're reading it, that's kind of an issue. It's like, it's, it's if it's not written yeah. in a certain, like standard form, which I had to learn. And I learned it that way. I was like, oh, okay, there's a language barrier. There's, um, and I think, you know, um, Dana Schultz, she was so amazing in terms of the notes she gave me. Just like saying it's, it's here. There's just a difference between sharing a script for people in the industry and like, you know exactly what you're gonna shoot. So you're gonna shoot it. And for me, it was definitely like a script that I'm gonna shoot because I'm gonna direct it, not I'm gonna sell this. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's, that's how I feel about my feature. Like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in directing what I write. I'm not, um, I am not like a traditional writer for hire per se, though I do love like the opportunity to, to do that like, for television. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a first draft and it got in and I think I learned a lot and the notes I got were that it's amazing and there's somewhat of a language barrier. And I think when you're the only black woman in an institute, that's kind of an issue. And it was very inclusive and it was diverse, but, um, I think we meet, we, being the only person in a room becomes, um, challenging because there's like, who are you bouncing your ideas off of? And then right. you know, there becomes like, is it accessible? And it's like, well, what, is, like, what does that mean? Um, yeah, it's very subjective. To, yeah, it's subjective and accessible to whom? And if the majority of the industry is, you know, white or white men or white women, then, then we have kind of an issue in terms of what you mean by accessibility. Um, so yeah, yeah. It was definitely, now I think about it, the draft and now where it's at now, it was definitely very, very experimental. <laughs> oh, see? <laughs> and I mean, just not finished, but you know, that's, that is what it is. Your work covers a lot of socio-political themes, you know, such as race and gender. Um, so what do you do to recharge or maybe just deal with life, you know, in a lighter way? Do you want to make work that maybe is in different genres, you know, how do you see the future of your career playing out? I'm trying, I was like, I don't think I make socio-political work, but that's probably, that's a lie. I think I make, I make work, <laughs> I make work that feels like me. Yeah. And I come from like a very particular background, you know, 
um, my mom used to uh, do a lot of, you know, rank and file work um, in the civil rights movement, and you know, Amazing. she used to do body, bodyguard work. Um, my dad used to like write speeches, and he also was very influential in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, they're both like Marxists, and they were very like militantly anti-racist. Um, and my mom never called herself a feminist, but I mean, she definitely is. Mm -hmm. And my aunt identified as an eco-feminist. So she was already talking about climate um, and kind of the feminine principle and um, or femme principle and thinking about the planet in a certain way where we're giving back as much as we are taking or that it's, it's a, a relationship as opposed to like just always an imperialistic colonization of resources um, from a place of scarcity. So there, I was definitely influenced by my family in terms of the way I see the world. I also don't, I don't like to preach to people very directly mm -hmm. about how they should live their lives. Cause like, my mom also gave me that freedom. You know, she, she was an atheist, which is not very popular as a Puerto Rican woman, but she let me go to church and I went to many different churches. So there was always a sense of curiosity. And um, I try to keep that present in my work where like, I'm proud of where I come from, but I also know part of that pride is, was it, was that like, were my parents not saying you have to be like super radical like me? Um, and trusting my own path. And I worked, I used to work at Color Lines for a little bit, I used to intern there. Um, and when I was a journalist, I was very interested in race, gender, and pop culture and that intersection and how mass media, like what, what are the messages that we are absorbing from it? And um, kind of like, you know, thinking about how we can do better, but not in a way that's like, I know better per se, but right i have questions about this like mm -hmm. i have questions as to why when we think of latinx we think very light skin very long straight hair when i know like dominicans puerto ricans also are are black like and there's a certain weird imaging that's happening um that feels not expansive enough um or the certain conversations or like certain stereotypes that just aren't helpful so it's, it's, and also, you know, thinking about how I can not, not make work that's trying to explain everything about my culture to white people. Um, Cause that, that does not feel fun to me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think it's so cute. Definitely a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not mad, like, I think it also just depends on how you were raised. And I, it's like, I don't knock, um, there's plenty of filmmakers I love who I feel like their audience is, they are trying to explain because they may have, may have gone to Yale or Harvard and have, and have felt, um, have, have had a different coming of age experience, but I, you know, I went to Howard. So I had a different, like, I just wanted to reflect where I'm coming from. So, um, and you know, I don't, I don't knock like a show like Girls because that's where they're coming from. It's just about like, can, can we expand, um, like have some more space in mass media so that we're not watching the same shit over and over again, or the same mumblecore over and over again, or the same, you know what I mean? Like we just, I think we just deserve more. Um, right. And yeah, so I, I write, I write about race and gender because I'm black, you know, Puerto Rican, I'm femme, but I also feel like I'm mask presenting at times. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm me. And so I, I think, and I know there's a lot of people within my community that my work will resonate with and I just trust in that. And so if it's socio-political, like, great. Do you want to stay on this path? Do you, do you have, do you want to work on like, I don't know, a comedy or superhero film? Yeah, it's funny. I don't, I don't ever think of genre in that way. I definitely want to okay, make- it's just really more of your perspective. Got you. Yeah, it's kind of just like, I kind of just make something and then if I share it, I'm like, oh, what, what genre is this? <laughs> and they'll be like, oh, it kind of feels like that. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I, yeah, I, I try, and I think it's just because I didn't come from film school that there's a certain like, 
um, language I'm not used to, but they're all, all there are there are also films like I've been obsessed with. Like I loved Hitchcock growing up or Stanley Kubrick. I think there is something about horror and surrealism and dreaming that I really like. But um, okay. you know, I also like yeah. I also don't want to limit myself. Um, I would totally do a superhero film. I would totally do if it if it feels like fundamentally at its core rooted in you know expanding the way we see um black femme queer people like i'm down and in ways that don't feel like like oh let me explain everything about the, the words i use in my community like i'm down you know I, I want i want stories that um feel cinematic you know um push boundaries are photographed beautifully um where we can just be and it's not dictated in terms of like tropes and like you know constantly selling or um the commodification of black culture you know it can just be enough for us to like hang out on screen and have a intimate conversation as well as like you know be in wakanda that all of those things are valid um so yeah i i, I try to be open and think more about like how I can stick to my um why I wake up in the morning which is like to create amazing stories about understated bravery hope and transformation um and love awesome awesome um can you talk a little bit about your partnership with Terrence I know you mentioned it before um you know did he play a role in advocating for you to direct any of these projects you know how do you guys work together yeah I mean we worked on random acts of flyness and I, I think it was a collaboration like I'm very thankful for being able to work on that show as a writer as a director as an actor as an editor um and be able to be in all of those different roles because I feel like it made me a better filmmaker and it was also something I just really wanted to do and I didn't even think twice about it I was like yeah um you know, we've made a music video together. Um, and I always, I had put him in my short films in the past and I've directed him um, on the show a few times. And yeah, I think, I think we have a really good collaborative relationship that has just developed over the years. But now I feel like there are, I'm sort of interested in working on my own you know and developing my own projects and he's he's very supportive as are like all of my friends who i've worked with on random acts of flyness in terms of like you know i'll share a script with them and they'll all kind of give me notes yeah so i, I find i find him to be a very supportive ally um but i've also you know have felt very fortunate to have met like lena waith and that she um gave me a shot to direct a pilot which completely changed my career, you know? Um, and I also feel very fortunate to have worked with Crystal Moselle at Betty, um, you know, and being able to work on that show. And, and Tanya Siracho too, who um, is the creator of Stars, And her kind of giving me, um, just like having been in all of these spaces and these rooms and seeing how different creators make, I've learned a lot from them um and from each person like there is a bit of craft that only they can kind of pull off and uh, i think that has definitely influenced um the way i would want to work as a creator of a show and also um yeah i just feel very very fortunate that this is a, a time where i can also work with that many different types of creators uh, within the television space and they've all been very, very supportive in different ways. Um, I've loved working with all of them. And I think it's just sort of like, it's just like there's a movement happening. I'm very, I'm very excited to continue shaping culture across mediums. So I'm a Flatbush girl too. Damn. So, yeah. <laughs> I grew up closer to like Empire, but um, anyway, I won't bore the listeners with that. But I would love to know how Flatbush inspires you as an artist. Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's where I spent so much of my life. Mm -hmm. um, it's a predominantly like Haitian neighborhood. I remember, you know, I, I had a pretty strict 
mom. <laughs> you know, I remember having to be home at a certain time. So I didn't get to hang out quite a bit, but like my best friend, we would find ways to like, you know, take a two hour walk when we were supposed to just be going to the bodega up the block. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, I just, I loved, I loved growing up in Flatbush cause I felt, I felt safe and, and very tapped in. I felt, um, I remember going to so many uh, demonstrations, unfortunately against police brutality. I remember like Abner Louima and Amadou Diallo and how, um, how gripping that was for the city. And it, it, in some ways I have like protest fatigue because of how young I was um, kind of in the streets with my mom, uh, mm-hmm. you know, on a bullhorn. And, you know, Flatbush is just such a, I mean, it's definitely has changed, but what I remember most was there's just nothing like having grown up within a Caribbean community. And I don't know, like, how do you feel about Flatbush? It's just like, to me, it's in the work, like, you know, Nuka Land, we shot it down the block from my house. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, being Puerto Rican (laughs) in Flatbush, I remember growing up and it being kind of interesting only because I feel like there, there was not a weird, weird tension, but there was definitely, you know, growing up around like my friends were Trini, Trinidadian and Jamaican. And, you know, we used to crack jokes on each other, but I did, I did get a feeling that there was like, Oh, okay. There's some interesting like pigmentocracy or like colorism within the Caribbean community and like mm. how colonization has, has in some ways influenced the way we joke about each other or like anti-blackness and like, you know, um, my friends would joke, jokingly say like, oh, but you're not like really Puerto Rican. And, and what they meant by that is like, you know, you can stay, like, you're cool, you're fine. I was like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and, you know, right. understanding that, you know, white, white supremacy, which is why I think we don't have to make work about white people per se, because it's like, it's constantly on the margins of even like an, a, a predominantly black neighborhood like Flatbush in our interactions, just because um, the way, you know, somebody might value a certain education system that you can only get uh, in Jamaica because it's like English or, you know what I mean? It's just like- I do, I do. You know what I mean, yeah. And or there's just a lot of like, oh shit, okay. Um, But also there was a lot of like compassion and taking care of each other too. It wasn't all like, nasty I never I never got into any fights I remember like um mm-hmm. maybe being like yo meet me out like I remember things being very very punctual like I'm gonna beat you up at 3 p.m so be there <laughs> I would show up and <laughs> nobody would be there but like it was just it was just it was an interesting you had to have a tough skin um you had to just know how to like adapt real quick you know say something funny to maybe not get hit, act crazier than another kid to not get hit. Um, but it, it was fun. I loved it. And I loved also going back and forth between Manhattan, where I went to high school, and going back to Brooklyn. Because like all of my friends um, were from like Brownsville, Bed-Stuy, Flatbush. And we would go to Manhattan and like hang out in Lincoln Center and take up space and dance around there and like um, be very proud of where we were coming from and really like understanding even at that age how how institutions don't always like make young black kids feel comfortable um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know like being quote unquote too loud and like yeah it was just like I don't know I love my community and I try to make as much work about them in the way that I I remember and recount um, some of those those times where there was like a friction and fraught tension between, you know, um, I love where I'm from, but I also have experienced moments where like, you know, my queerness was not accepted, but it also it came from a place of wanting to protect me from, from abuse or from being um, hurt by people who didn't know me. So, you know, it was very complicated, um, like any community. And I think 
I'm really interested in those stories where it's not like um, black people are more homophobic. It's no, it's like no homophobia exists ev everywhere. You know, it just it just is articulated in these very specific ways because of this community and what it means in this history and um, and how can we show that and how can we you know um, figure out how to have a conversation as if it's just like me, my aunt, my cousin in, in the living room. Before we close, can you tell us what's next for you? What is next? Ugh, I wish I could tell you what was next before this pandemic happened, but <laughs> I can't, I can't. Um, what's next? I mean, I'm fortunate um, to be able to work um, at my desk. I'm, I'm, I'm writing, finishing that screenplay. <laughs> um, that you are telling me was shredded up, which I'm, I just so want to know what was the context of that um, rumor, but. Not your script, but just in general, that's what they tend to do to people who get into Sunday. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that no, I, was, I wasn't that. making a dig at your script at all. I was like, damn. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm revising that. Um, <laughs> I'm pitching on a few on a few films, you know, fingers crossed, prayers out there. And um, yeah, I'm just like kind of finding my way and, and really taking the time now to like prioritize because I think what what I'm learning um, by sitting alone in a room is like what matters most and why I do the things I do. And I mean, I have I have like four films on this drive right now I need to edit. So I have a lot of work um, that I can Feature finish. films? There are some short, there are some short films, some documentary stuff um, I'm developing. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to figure out what comes up first and next and third and fourth and fifth. So, I mean, there's a lot coming up, um, but mostly it's about, you know, the artistry and strategies that young black femme women kind of move through, like how we move through the world freely and kind of just reminding that whatever we want, we can have it now, even if the world says that we can't. And so I, that's why I make the work that I, I do. And like try to make it fun, try to make it visually arresting and um, kind of push people to think beyond what, what their expectations are. Um, so that we all know it's like possible. Well, Naima, thank you so much for chatting with us today on the Black Film Space podcast. Congratulations to you and all of your professional accomplishments. And we will definitely be supporting you. Um, and feel free to reach out to us for support. We're here as a resource. Thank you. Oh, and watch Body Cam. That's the next thing. <laughs> OK, <laughs> we will. Oh. <laughs> Body Cam, yes. I got it. Body cam, I think it's going to be maybe on BT. Okay. It's directed by Malik Batal. I have a small role in it. I play a cop. But don't worry. It's not, it's not bad. bad. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then also there's episode five of Betty. Um, I co-wrote with Veronica Jade. Um, so that's something to look out for that's coming out soon. Okay. So stay tuned. I am writing this down. Yes. Support. All right. Thank you so much, Naima. This was fun. All right. Thank you so Take much. Take care. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.